Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, Health and Wellbeing uh, Scrutiny Committee meeting on the 29th of November. Uh, item number one, uh, apologies. I, uh, Sorry, first of all, a reminder to two members that the meeting is being recorded and will be available to view on YouTube after the meeting. Uh, I've received apologies from Councillor Kingston, Councillor Smith and Councillor Jay. Uh, does anybody know of any other apologies? Okay. Uh, on, uh, item number two, uh, minutes from the previous meeting. There's two sets of minutes, uh, one from the 12th of July and a further from the 18th of October. Uh, because there's uh, different uh, members at different meetings there, we'll take the first one first, 12th of July. Could I get a uh, Councillor Kymore and Councillor Rogers? And uh, vote of hands on that one. Thank you. I think they were just wasn't they? Yeah. Uh, and the second one, the 18th of October. I'll first that, and either Councillor Rogers or Councillor Wadrup to second, if possible, please. Uh, Councillor Wadrup, second. Okay. Uh, show of hands. Item number three, declarations of interest. Uh, has there anybody got any declarations of interest? Uh, item number four, update from the chair. Um, I'd just like it put down on the minutes, if possible, that I'd like to say thank you to uh, Councillor Claymore for all she did for the committee. Uh, and I hope that uh, Meno can continue to work together uh, for the people of Tamworth. And that is all. I have on the update of the chair for now. Uh, item number five, homelessness strategic update 2022. Um, we have the portfolio holder, uh, uh, Councillor Farrell, uh, Terry O'Brien, who's representative of the Harbour Tamworth Community Project, Assistant Director, Tina Mustafa, and the Head of Homelessness, Sarah Finnegan. Uh, I'd just like to hand over to the officers for the presentation, please. Uh, and Councillor Farrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm very conscious the football's on soon, so I'm going to hand it over. But I'm just going to say uh, I'm very pleased with the work um, that you're about to see. Um, very proud of the team. It's a very important issue, homelessness, um, and the team is, is mega focused on it. And I'm incredibly uh, impressed with the things we're doing with the heart of Tamworth, and that's uh, expanding, and you'll find out a bit more about that shortly. But I'll hand over to Tina. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight to talk about homelessness and take the opportunity to update on our homelessness strategy. Um, we're now sort of two years into that uh, policy framework now, so tonight is a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of, of where we are. I think we've got a um, sort of three-pronged attack, if you like, in terms of, of covering that, so I'll let colleagues talk to you about themselves as we get to their relevant bit. Um, but I'm just going to start off by sort of talking to you about the context and a bit of a recap in terms of why the homelessness strategy is so important. So we're going to cover the policy framework nationally um, as part of the scoping exercise that we've done with the committee previously. We're then going to talk about the definitions of homelessness and rough sleeping because they are different. Um, we're going to share with you some of the latest homelessness data. Um, obviously, we follow that closely because that informs the uh, annual review and continual health checks against our improvement plan. We're then going to talk to you about some of the achievements and progress on that homelessness strategy. Um, and then, obviously, we're going to introduce Terry formally and talk to you about the winter relief project that we you know, have run for many years now with the heart of Tamworth and how we are... Um, anticipating making recommendations to Cabinet in February to extend that, um, particularly around concepts of a vulnerability and homelessness hub as well that we're also looking to take to Cabinet in February. So we very much welcome your feedback and input into that. Um, so first slide please, thank you. Um, so the, the, the first slide really just sort of tells you the sort of plethora of portfolios that this covers in terms of the Department for Levelling Up Housing and Communities. For those of you who've heard the presentations before, you'll know that previously um, the Minister was Eddie Hughes who um, covered homelessness, but as you can see there, 
Um, it's now split across three portfolio, three portfolios within government. Um, so we've got the strategic sort of responsibility that links to the housing strategy. There's then a um, MP specifically covering rough sleeping and supported housing, uh, Felicity Buchanan, and obviously Lee Rowley, who was the former minister, housing minister before, is now leading on elements to do with the integration strategy in communities. So it really is a complex. Uh, portfolio and, and I think any questions that in detail that you've got tonight you know we can follow that up if we can't cover it all because I'm I'm sure between Sarah Alex Terry and myself we could probably speak forever on the subject because we are passionate about the services that we deliver so in terms of that strategic overview next slide please thank you um, this is just a reminder of that national context so the rough sleeping strategy that the that the government published back in 2018 set out the government's vision to halve rough sleeping by 2022 and end it by 2025. And there are links um, online to the, the government's agenda around that. And that remained unchanged. And that was some of the cornerstone within our um, harmlessness, strategy, harmlessness and rough sleeping strategy that we adopted back in 2020. So every local authority now has to publish that. Um, as covers us the period 2020 to 2025, but we are intending to update that in February to take account of the um, challenges that we've faced since then, not least the pandemic um, and the legacy from that, but also things around the cost of living crisis, um, Brexit and other international impacts on us that would impact on homelessness, homelessness. And you'll see some of that as we talk about the detail later. Um, there's also uh, the guidance around ending rough sleeping and that updated, updated detail was published in September and the links again are in your pack for that. Um, but the strategy is around those three core pillars and they sound simple but it's worth reminding that they, they cover prevention, intervention and recovery and I'll say something about those later as we talk about how we've responded to some of those challenges. But the, def the, the vision that the government point to is that homelessness is prevented wherever possible and where it does occur it should be brief, rare and non-recurrent. So that's why we look at the data around what we refer to as revolving door homelessness. So people who repeatedly come to us looking at the causation around that to try and tackle some of that. So I'll hand over to Sarah for the next couple of slides and she'll talk to you about those definitions and some of that data. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Tina. Um, lovely. So on this slide, I just thought I'd cover tonight um, the definitions of homelessness. Um, obviously, rough sleeping is the most visible and dangerous form of homelessness, and that's what, when most people think of a homeless person, they tend to think of people sleeping um, rough on the streets. However, um, it can be you can be classed legally as homeless um, if you have a roof over your head. So you may be homeless if you're staying with friends or family. Um, sofa surfing, which is classed as hidden homelessness. You might be staying in a hostel or night shelter or bed and breakfast. Um, or you might be at risk of violence or domestic abuse. Um, or even living in poor conditions that might affect your health. Um, also, when we define homelessness, we have to look at if accommodation is not reasonable for somebody to continue to occupy, um, or if they cannot secure entry to it, or if they haven't got a legal right to that um, accommodation. And being homeless or at risk of homelessness can affect anyone. Um, so from single households to families, you could be leaving home for the first time or leaving care. You could be pregnant with nowhere to stay when baby arrives. You could be struggling to live on benefits or on a low income and struggling to pay your rent, um, as well as being a victim of domestic abuse or hate crime. Um, and just under that definition, so when somebody is statutory homeless, local authorities have a duty to secure um, a home for some groups of people, and this is often referred to as the main homelessness duty. Um, and every year, nationally, tens of thousands of people in the UK apply for homeless assistance to local authorities. Next slide, please. So as Tina mentioned, when we scoped um, with members, they wanted a little bit of information on local connection criteria, which is just one of the criteria that officers have to look at when they're assessing somebody under homelessness. So I thought I'd just briefly um, cover it in this section. When you make a homeless application, there's only ever one main applicant um, and you have to have a local connection to that area. So the local 
council will check. If you don't, then they will refer you to the council where you might have. Quite often it's quite as simple as if you've lived in the area for six out of 12 months or three out of the five years. And just to note that the council can't refer anybody back to an area where they might be at risk of violence or um, domestic abuse. And then also just to say time spent in prison or hospitals um, doesn't count towards it. And then for the other route, the, the council's housing register route, applicants may be awarded local connection status if they've got two years residency, um, permanent employment, or have lived with their family here in Tamworth for five years and there's additional care and welfare support needs. There is other exemptions and special reasons applied to care leavers and other vulnerable groups as well. Next slide, please. So this year, um, as we always do, from 2010, all local authorities have been required to submit an annual snapshot figure to DLUCH to indicate the number of people sleeping rough in their area um, on a typical night. So. Any local authority can do this between the 1st of October and the 30th of November. Some authorities undertake a full physical spot count on the night in question, um, whilst we use at Tamworth an evidence-based assessment estimate. So for that reason, the, the approach at Tamworth is evidence-based due to historically we have low numbers of rough sleepers. Um, we have good partnership networks and the sleep sites in Tamworth are a mix of urban and rural sites which if you're asked to do a spot check after midnight might not be des deemed necessarily safe for staff to do so due to Tamworth's location an estimate is deemed to produce the most accurate return. Um, this year we're really really pleased to say that um, whilst it's not zero we recorded two um, on the night, one that we are aware of and the other actually was found accommodation the very next day. So it does remain positive in the sense that it is below five. Um, the count doesn't include people in hostels or shelters or sofa service. It's very, um, yeah, it's very specific to how we record it and we link in with Homeless Link and we get it verified by a local charity um, in Tamworth when we submit to DLUC. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this one, um, we thought we'd add some data to this evening's presentation. Um, this is reasons for approach to Tamworth Borough Council um, over the past few years. We've got the 10 top reasons on the left-hand side, and then just on the right-hand side, the top five reasons at the moment, based on the data that we've got from our software, is um, the number one, um, reason for approaching as homeless is being asked to leave by family or friends. Um, number two is end of private rented tenancy. Number three, uh, relationship breakdown. Four, domestic abuse. And five, the end of social housing tenancies. Um, we do anticipate these reasons for approaching changing due to the cost of living crisis and fuel poverty. Um, so we will wait and see and update you. And just to say with the figures on the right, for 2022, that's a part year at the moment, so that's why they're slightly less um, at the moment. Next slide, please. So this one gives us an overview of the top five support needs um, of clients approaching Tamworth for homeless assistance. Um, the top five at the moment are history of mental health problems being number one, um, secondly, physical ill health and disability. Um, third would be at risk of or has experienced domestic abuse and that also includes perpetrators in that because we define both of them between victim and perpetrator. Um, young person aged 18 to 25 years requiring support, offending and offending history. Um, and again, that's just a prediction up and well it's not a prediction, it's based on what we've got and that's why 22 is slightly less at the moment. I do think it's nice to note that the history of mental health problems, which is our top one, is reducing, which I can only hopefully put down to the support with MPFT, Better Way Recovery, um, and other partnership working that we've got here in Tamworth. And also just to note that one person can have five or six support needs. So this is just an overview of the top five support needs, but one client may have more than one support need.
Next slide, please. So this one um, covers our assistance to rough sleepers um, and those at risk of rough sleeping since the pandemic. Um, the rough sleeping initiative was successfully delivered between July 21 and the end of June this year and our own rough sleeping plan is on track. Um, from the project, 23 clients were assisted in total. 17 clients were assisted by outreach support officers um, to steer chaotic and complex individuals into pathways of longer term accommodation. 10 were supported by a mental health support worker at the time and 11 were supported by our neighbourhood coach to help them sustain tenancies for six months or more. And just to give you an overview, um, since the start of the pandemic, we have assisted 143 people, single should I say, um, into supported accommodation that's not council stock. Um, that project worked really well and as of the 1st of December we've also been fortunate enough to secure our outreach officer again for a further two years which is really positive um, because she did great work and I'll hand over to Tina, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Um, yes, yeah, so our next slide, thank you uh, Jo. Um, so as you can see, you know, a really robust picture in terms of some of that data and intelligent led service design um, just to sort of point to the achievements um, and then how we've sort of delivered that I mean at the moment we we continue to have single figures in bed and breakfast which when we are routinely um, visited by HAST which is the Harmlessness Advisory Support Team who are our regional advisors um, they have identified us as best practice in that area and, and I'll tell you why in, in a moment in terms of that framework but we continue to enjoy those low, low numbers although we are starting to see an increase in terms of presentations mm -hmm. and in terms of forecasting the likely impacts of things like the cost of living crisis we probably will see that go up but we think we're best placed to to manage some of that um we've got a um a fully compliant um system where we can upload the government required data through h click as it's called um and you know that allows us to input um that information into that and um, we do work collaboratively because I'm, I'm the idea of neighbourhoods, I've also got responsibility for the council's housing management, council housing function. So we do work collaboratively across that, using some of council stock for temporary accommodation, which allows us to have that step up and step down approach. Um, and in terms of the success, I think, you know, it goes without saying, and Terry's testament to some of this tonight, that we have benefited from a really strong and engaging anchor organisation network that we can draw on to to help us support that but obviously the challenges remain around affordability clients and their caseload remains incredibly complex um, and you know we reach out to a range of providers to um, to work through that um, performance is strong but clearly that impacts then sometimes on our ability to attract external funding through harmlessness prevention grant funding although we are well versed in being able to say how we sustain and how we prevent harmlessness which is which has meant we've not seen a reduction in those funding levels um, Obviously, our expectations continue to, to rise as we have varied our service offer and we have tried to switch to more of a um, triage type approach. There's an expectation that we respond in the moment to things, so we do have to balance that. Um, and we do have to recognise that we, you know, we treat people in terms of names, not numbers. So where we have got revolving door cases, then, you know, probably... You know, not that we can mention any names tonight, but if you do know of names, we probably know those people and they're on our radar. Um, and we recognise that we are also, um, given our location, we, you know, we do have cross-border placements which impact on that and which we try to support. So next slide, please, Jo, thank you. Um, so our... So what, I suppose, is the question. So what are we doing all about that? What's our operational grip around that? And our homelessness and rough sleeping strategy provides that framework. Framework, And I mentioned earlier around it being to do with prevention, early intervention and recovery. So we've very much got that three-pronged approach. The first bit, if you like, is around maximising 
um, the availability of affordable housing, you know, because ultimately that's what it's about. And again, we've got a range of things that we do there. We do discharge into the private sector, so we've got a healthy relationship through our private sector landlords, and, and obviously Jo heads that, and we work closely with Jo and her team on that. Um, we also look to tailor some of our acquisitions um, to help provide um, stock where we know we've got gaps in different types of provision, and I work closely with um, the AD of, of assets, Paul Weston, on that. Um, as I've mentioned, we do use our council stock for some of our temporary accommodation, and we do have a dynamic purchasing arrangement um, with some of our providers in the town, so that, you know, particularly around the winter when we know there are pressures, we've got stock that we can put people in if we're not able to empower them to self help. Um, which is always our preferred approach. So we've got a whole range of things, and you know that's probably oversimplistic, but a whole range of things on that particular element. In terms of prevention, so you've seen from some of the data, because all this is intelligence-led, family breakdowns is one of the biggest areas and causation of homelessness. So our officers are trained mediators, and we do work with families to try and keep people at home. You know, very often we've got somebody who might ring us up over a weekend saying, "Mom's kicked me out." what can we do and we speak to the parents and rehabilitate that so that we can get people back home um, and that works nine times out of ten believe it or not um, and then we also use our homelessness grant funding our housing solutions fund um, to support you know and alleviate um, it you know potential threats of eviction um, so and particularly at Christmas we have a, um, a no eviction sort of arrangement over the key period so that we can support people through private landlords, mortgage rescue etc in terms of trying to achieve that. Um, but also in terms of the early intervention and this is areas we are particularly proud of is through our partnership arrangements and and obviously we work closely with Jo and her team to do this and particularly through Tamworth Advice Centre we invest in debt advice you know again from the data you can see that people you know who are struggling we can try and target support around that we are also particularly proud of our relationships with MPFT I know he's been to this committee before and given presentations so that's always have to look at my notes the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust uh, and Humankind who provide specialist advice for people with complex needs as well as onward support in terms of peripatetic support to help people with lifestyle skills etc um, and then obviously you'll hear from Terry in a moment in terms of the heart of Tamworth and the work that we do at, um, through the Schwepp arrangement, the severe weather emergency protocol that we're going to be looked to extending all year round, not just um, over the winter months, because that really does provide that holistic um, support for individuals and households to prevent homelessness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, can, I mean, there's a whole long list and that is very much a whistle-stop tour and there's not much that we haven't thought of that isn't part of our strategy. And I'm going to end on some of our Housing First pilots and ideas and how they're emerging. But just before I finish off, I just want to introduce Terry and let Terry tell you something about the heart of Tamworth. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Um, heart of Tamworth um, charity... Uh, which will be supporting um, the homeless this year uh, again, which um, uh, I'm proud to be involved with and encouraged and uh, excited about. Um, um, we'll be offering a floating support um, 28 hours a week, um, and the, the uh, community worker will be me, who will be uh, working on the ground with the homeless individuals, uh, possibly families as well. Um, it'll range from um, befriending, um, working with them in weekly surgeries um, based at our St John the Baptist Church uh, community rooms uh, and also at Sacred Heart if, if that's necessary. So we can float between the two to offer that service. Uh, so um, there will also be um, places of warmth as well. Um, we'll be doing, obviously, signposting where necessary. Um, we have worked with many individuals with varying degrees of mental health problems, um, uh, from um, being stable in the morning 
to severely affected by the, by the evening. I've had many calls through the evening uh, from people who are suicidal and we've had to refer them to the crisis team that way. So um, um, our services offer food deliveries. We have a, um, what we call the hot shop at uh, Sacred Heart. You're probably aware of it locally, um, the community pantry. Uh, so we have access to food there, which we can, uh, I'll probably deliver that myself, or we'll have volunteers who can deliver to, to various individuals or families that are located around the town. Um, we also have links with uh, many of the service providers that's already been mentioned. Um, we have groups at Sacred Heart, Samaritans, SARAC, um, Everyone Health, um, we're even uh, um, starting a project with uh, Burton and District Mind who are offering uh, um, a mental health safe haven uh, three evenings a week plus at the weekends. So we have the opportunity there to um, uh, provide um, mental health support for individuals who are homeless or otherwise. Um, um, we also help with uh, the day-to-day -day living. Um, so somebody who needs to open a bank account, someone who needs help with their, um, their benefits, we can support that. But rather than signpost in, this, in the, the, the normal terminology, here you are, here's a number, here's an address, I will accompany them, I'll go with them. Uh, support them, help them, uh, and on a couple of occasions, um, two individuals who both have uh, very poor mental health had real difficulty even approaching the bank. Um, so going in with them, knowing there's somebody there to support them, neither of these individuals had ID to go in with. So, you know, we managed to talk to the bank go through various details and um, with the support of the council as well we were able to get the bank account set up and running which was uh, uh, a great achievement for them not not just for us it's for, for the individual we want this to be a person-centered um, working arrangement um, and we see ourselves at heart of tamworth as, as an extension of the work that the council do so any work that I do is fed back to the council team. Um, any safeguarding issues, mental health issues, uh, are reported back and fed back. So if I see something that's uh, maybe a person of a violent nature um, who hasn't shown any tendencies to the council initially, I can feed that back so they're aware. So if they send a housing officer out, they're, they're going to be aware that there perhaps needs to be two or accompanied with uh, uh, someone to support them. Um, so there's a, a wide ranging service that, that we offer through our floating support. Um, and uh, we are responsive uh, to when the call comes through. Uh, and if we get a call from the council team to, uh, to assist them or to back them up in any way, we're there to support. Um, we're here to put that wraparound service, but also act as a bridge for individuals who find discussing things with the council difficult. There's a fear there. You know, they don't give all the information out. So my role then is to give them the confidence that they can approach the council um, with all the information that they've got. There's no fear. I try and take the fear away from them. Um, and, uh, but it's about trust, um, and it's trust building. So uh, um, if there's any questions, there's probably a lot of questions to the floor there. Thank you, Thank you Tina. Thank you, Terry. So just to finish off and then we will open it up for questions for you. So um, next slide, please, Joe. So the final slide, um, the proposals to Cabinet in February will be not only to sort of set out our progress around the homelessness strategy, but also to develop the concept of, of a homelessness hub. Now, 
um, as part of the housing uh, harmlessness strategic agenda, it talks about housing first. Um, now, that's a concept really about tenancy sustainment and putting harmlessness prevention right at the core. So it works on the basis that everybody's human right is to have, you know, the, the cornerstone of a of, 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 you know, a safe, warm, secure environment is having a home by which to live in. Um, and, you know, being able to survive, thrive as well as aspire, you know, people need that. Um, that accommodation to do that and that's really the fundamental principle around housing first that you know by providing that accommodation and providing that wraparound service and that person centric service that will allow people to sustain um, settled accommodation longer term so certainly the discussions with um, with our partners, with some of our stakeholders, with some of our residents, has been to develop this idea around how we can support those who are most vulnerable in this area. So it's another strand of our vulnerability strategy. Um, and it's a tailored service that almost acts as a front door, if you like, in terms of preventing harmlessness. Because our figures, when HAST came, the Harmlessness Advisory Support Team, our prevention figures looked low. But that's because we relieved that before it's even... Um, you know, recorded as a prevention because under the Homelessness Reduction Act you have to relieve homelessness before you then go on to, to deal with that. So so it, we, we sort of are victims of our own success in that area. So by being able to record that um, shows the real extent of the work we do and, and Housing First very much is around providing that peripatetic support where people in a safe non-judgmental space can access all those lifestyle skills to help sustain um, tenancies um, but it goes further than that and it sort of makes sure that the outcome to that is settled accommodation um, and that's built into that offer. So we are developing that as a set of principles. We've been working that up with partners, um, but it's likely that we'll be asking Cabinet in February to support the procurement of that um, so that you know a number of partners could express an interest. And we see it very much as a plethora or a multi-agency-led uh, opportunity anyway. Um, so yes, that's it from us. I apologise that it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. As I say, we could deal probably with any one of those things in some depth, uh, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, thank you everyone uh, for that presentation. Um, very promising, uh, especially with the figures and how they're being kept down. Um, I'd just like to open it up for any questions from the floor. Uh, Council Quirex. Thank you, Chair. Um, Tina, um, I was quite interested to read uh, in the rough sleeping bit that somebody actually refused. What, what sort of grounds would they refuse to be sort of offered a, a shelter for the night? That seems rather odd. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that question. Fantastic question, Councillor Greatrix. Um, it's because often when we identify people, we, we define people as transient sometimes who, you know, who uh, may not be rough sleeping but may be begging and who may just be coming to Tamworth to do that and actually, you know, we've got somewhere that they can live. So when we do engage with them and we do offer accommodation or we do offer support, they don't need it because they present as rough sleeping, but on investigation are not. Um, so, but yeah, I think. And, and there are other issues, as, as Sarah said, around mm -hmm. mental health. And some people, you know, it, believe it or not, is a lifestyle choice and they prefer not to engage with agencies. Um, but again, when we do come across those individuals or those people, you know, we, whilst they may refuse to engage with us, we do signpost out to other agencies to try and get them some independent help, such as the Heart of Tamworth, such as some of our volunteer partner organisations. Um, and there, are, there is also um, a mentoring network with people who are prepared to work with us who have been through homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, and we do also ask them to try and engage with people. So again, that's been really successful. But yeah, people just don't want the help. And Tamworth have got a really good offer. You know, that I would like to think that under our watch, there's nobody that we don't offer that help to. If they are not in accommodation, it's because they either don't want it um, or we don't know about it. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, in, in July 2021, you was given £100,000 
of the for the um, the government awarded for the rough sleepers initiative has that been spent did you manage to spend that on what what it says that it did um, and um, obviously you, I know you mentioned about housing solutions your outreach officer your mental health worker and neighborhood coach has that all been achieved in that I'm just asking the question because it's interesting to read um, that yeah thank you I mean we're really pleased with that I mean we met with um, Hast around that and they identified us as best practice because we did spend that money. It was on those areas we've identified through neighbourhood coaching, mental health Brilliant. worker. We even had a specialist uh, nurse, I believe, who supported some of the severe weather emergency protocol to provide that out of hours outreach. Um, so we were required to do an impact assessment of that from the government funding and we've got a whole series of um, metrics, if you like, as well as case studies that so show some of that. Sarah, please add to that, because Sarah's got all no. the more detail. Thank you. And we had personal budgets assigned for rough sleepers as well, so if they needed clothes or anything for job interviews or even one somebody we assisted that needed a driving licence to go further. So I think in the end, um, we I think there's about four grand underspend, but that was due to staff leaving a month early, if I'm honest. Um, so yeah, we did spend it till its full potential and what we bid for. Yeah. Sorry, uh, the next one is I must say that, you know, quite impressed with your website or the fact sheets that you've got. I think that you should be really proud of yourselves how you've produced that because they are easy reading and they're tailored to every everybody. And you've also got your accessibility on there, which I think is really good and you should be really commending yourselves for that kind of work that you're doing. And the heart, you know, and the, the Sacred Heart, I went there last week and they're doing some fantastic work, um, so much so that I'm going to get involved in some of it myself as a person, not as a counsellor, but as an individual, because it's really interesting. I used to do that kind of thing years ago, you know, and not got round to it, but seeing them. And there are people there that need help that you, you know, you, you do miss, but it's good to offer that, you know, offer that back. I've been give, given the opportunity to be a counsellor so I want to offer something back as an individual um, for that service so that's you know yeah Councillor Climber Thank you Chair um, yeah when we look at the figures I know they're in your part year aren't they so they're up to now are they from April to now yeah okay um, yeah and they they look like they are coming down but are we prepared for the possibility that it may rise again because due to the financial crisis? I know, Tina, you said that we're prepared for that, but how, how are we prepared for that? Thank you. From an operational point of view, um, we've been really fortunate that we've actually just recruited to another for another Housing Solutions Officer post um, for two years. So following our visit from D Look and Hast in the summer, um, they were happy with our figures, but you're absolutely right. They said, you know, we are expecting a rise in homelessness, whether that be through paying rent, etc. So we have pre prepared for it, as in we've now got five housing solutions officers um, from that point of view. And I'll pass over to so. Yeah, thank you. I mean, being sort of data driven is absolutely key. Councillor Claymore, because as you can see from some of the figures there, and as Sarah's pointed out, they are only part year so far for this year. But we're looking at just over 400 2018, and we're already upwards of what 462, and we've got you know probably the worst period to go. So nationally, they're seeing an increase in presentations for homeless between 16 and 30 percent. So we're in line with the national trend, um, but we are seeing an increase, and that's why. We're looking at that data carefully because it's not only seeing an increase in presentations, but why are we seeing it? Are those top reasons in terms of family breakdown remaining the reason? Because then we can tailor our strategy accordingly. Do we need more trained mediators in the team, or is it about affordability and you know how we help people in terms of mortgage rescue or rent deposit schemes or all that kind of thing so we are seeing an increase we have got approval and cabinet have been supportive of extra resources into that team and we'll keep that under review thanks sir thank you i just want to say, and also we did subcommission um tamworth advice center are now doing a satellite at sacred heart on a monday um which we've used for our we've used our homeless prevention grant to fund that 
Um, and in the first three weeks, they saw seven clients and made a safe financial gain for those clients of about £10,000. Which And we've opened that up to obviously singles, families, anybody within Tamworth that needs to go, that can't, that needs a face-to-face -face appointment. We're sort of funding a caseworker up there, hopefully for the foreseeable future. And that builds on partnership working because Joe's team commissioned that. So, um, yeah, thank you. To add on, add on to that, and, and really, obviously, when we talk a little bit about the vulnerability, absolutely, uh, that leads into the homelessness. That we, we we identified that the housing was one of the one of the priorities within that. So yes, as Sarah's just said, that we've we've added on the commissioning for the Tamworth Advice Centre. We are, you know, actively looking at the engagement with, as you know, the mental health teams. They have actually undertaken to to provide a housing support worker for people on their caseload to try and prevent homelessness because it's one of the priorities for mental health as well. And obviously, as Sarah and uh, um, Tina alluded to, um, we've also commissioned the Better Way Recovery Service um, out of um, the, the, the CTCIC hub in Orchard Street to actually see clients with alcohol dependency on a peer support rather than actually they, they do send and actually assist people into recovery but a lot of it is peer support um, and they've actually seen quite a high increase in people going to the service which has then also meant we've commissioned an, a larger room um, to, to actually take the people who are going in so I think all the all the work that we're doing in we, you know to Sarah's team, my team through community safety, we are trying to put the levels of it early intervention and intervention in to prevent issues further along the line. So working in partnerships really being key to actually as part of the homelessness strategy as well. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just throw a couple out before anybody else wants to jump in. Um, in regards to the local connection, you did say that any stays in prison or hospital would rule somebody out. But if somebody was to be in hospital for, for a length of time, uh, for example, mental health, say they're, they're sectioned or they've gone involuntarily, if you're in hospital for longer than four weeks, you start losing uh, your disability living allowance, that sort of thing. So that's going to encroach on them being able to pay their rent. The, 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 if, they're, if they're on universal credit, the, the um, housing support's going to stop. The, if they have got mental health issues, is that going to rule them out under the time spent in hospital? It would. It, if they're a tenant, then it wouldn't do, no. If they approach, if we get a hospital discharge, then we, we've got good connections with um, the local hospital. So they do a duty to refer into the service. And then when we interview the client, we find out where their last settled address was. So we go on a five year housing history and we usually ask them, you know, obviously where did you sleep last night? You've been in hospital for four weeks and then we work back from that. But in somebody in the scenario that you're saying, if they're a tenant or if they've, then no, because the support would be there. Um, if it was private sector and, for example, the benefits did stop and then their landlord said, well, I'm serving you a Section 21, or then that's where our team would step in and say, well, hold on a second, we try and mediate. And also, if we can, we'd probably try and recoup and pay those arrears off for that person through the Housing Solutions Fund. So um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but I hope I've answered a little bit of it. Yeah, Chase, it was just a bit unclear in the talk about if somebody goes into hospital, it, it, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Um, you, you spoke about reasonable living conditions. Is there a, a framework for that as well? Because it, it doesn't quite go into it in the presentation. Yes, yeah, so there's always, um, if it's suitable, reasonable, um, and affordable so we do look at via the private sector standards so overcrowding standards um, if somebody's living if it's statutory overcrowded or if there's severe um, disrepair then you know we will send officers out and and have a look um, on a case-by-case -case basis and obviously it depends if it's a social tenancy or if it's private sector um, or if it's HMO children um, it's, it's quite a broad 
spectrum on that one. I can just add chair to that. I mean, the test for homelessness is if it's unreasonable for that person to remain in that property. So if we come across and, um, you know, with, with the household, the reasons are, for example, repairs, then we would try and work with that landlord um, to make sure that's, that's addressed. What we wouldn't do is accept that, that we've got to move people on because obviously that's taking a property out of the overall stock in Tamworth. We'd look to work with that landlord to restore that property to its appropriate condition. Um, you know, but it, the, the issue is, is it unreasonable to remain? And sometimes, you know, we do it in our own stock. You know, if there are significant repairs in our own stock, we might decant somebody temporarily while those repairs are done and move people back. So, as Sarah quite rightly says, there's not a one size fits all. And we, you know, but we work from the basis that we're going to try and keep people in their own home. Anybody else? I'm sorry, just one more. You know, in the light of the recent news about our Abbey Shack, have, you know, have you got a strategy in place to, um, obviously if people do say that, you know, phone up and say we've got mould or whatever, is there a strategy in place now for that because we don't want that to happen, you know, again to anybody? Absolutely. I mean, the, um, you know, that case, as with Grenfell, Lock and all before, have all triggered a range of building safety considerations. And... Um, the Minister uh, Gove has written to a number of um, local authorities, you know, who were involved in those incidents, asking them to rectify that. And indeed, he's written to every chief executive where there's council owned accommodation and other accommodation to make sure their strategies are in place around dealing with mould and damp. And there's a requirement to respond to that before Christmas, the 19th of December, on what those arrangements are. So, Paul Weston, head of, um, assistant director of assets, he's working with his team on, you know, reviewing everything because we've already got a good story to tell him in terms of how we detect and diagnose those issues. Certainly, we have in our own. Um, in-house repairs call centre we're able to diagnose those issues so together with partners and with um, repair and technical advice we're looking to make that response so I would imagine we'll be coming back with updates through cabinet and through scrutiny on those arrangements but yeah again that you know it's not just mould and damp it's any repair that would be prejudicial to health. Mm. In addition to that, you know, you have your annual gas checks, for example, or you do, you, you don't know if you do your annual tenancy checks. Is it worth putting that something like that in, in them kind of things into the checklist, just so that at least you've got a record and it can be recorded, just as a safeguarding for you know for the, the person living in the property, but for you know yourselves as well to make sure that things are happening. I'm not saying that you don't, but just looking at ideas, what you could do, maybe. Oops, yeah, absolutely great idea. And we already have a scheme called um, Every Tenant Matters and Something's Not Right card. So anybody who visits one of our properties or who visits anything within the private landlord, uh, pr private rented sector, um, if they observe something that gives them cause for concern, whether it's, I don't know, safeguarding or hoarding or repairs issues, then fill in this card and refer it on to the most appropriate team who will then investigate. And that's in addition to, um, you know, from a council housing perspective, we're required to do annual gas safety checks. We do a range of property checks and in the private sector, the similar uh, arrangements. So, so yeah, I mean, but I think we will be coming back with more detail on mould and damp specifically because of that very tragic case and we'll want to give reassurance to scrutiny and cabinet around that. Sorry, and also... I just add into that maybe a fact sheet on what causes mould and damp because sometimes it's not always down to you know it's just about telling people you know where they dry the clothes and things like that so it might just be worth having something like that put in place I know it's going to be a massive task but you know in a sense but just something maybe on the website even as well and direct people there so at least it gives you know an accessibility again to make sure it reaches everybody I'm just thinking of ideas that you oh, and I think there is a uh, a fact sheet already there that's in the process of being reviewed and looked at but there is one already there because you know it sort of tells it sort of tells you how many points of water it creates if you draw a towel on the radiator for example so yeah there is some good practice around that that we developed with previous portfolio holders which will be reviewed and updated thank you i don't know whether you want as, a, as an extra on that councillor wardrop we we as Tina's alluded to, Michael Gove has written to all the chief executives around social housing. There's also a letter around um, standards for the private sector rented 
which my team are looking at responding to for damp and mould. We don't necessarily at this point take damp and mould as a, a category one or two hazard, um, largely because of you just said, you know, there are fact sheets. We want to work with private landlords and tenants so that they are looking at those hazards within the home, which would prevent them having to leave, trying to work with them to make sure that they are taking that advice before we take further action. But again, as Tina's alluded to, we are completing that, that, that plan around how we look at category one and two hazards within a private sector rented accommodation so that we are actually moving forward looking at damp and mould and and an impact if there is an impact on on the resident that it's not that can't just be resolved by advice around how to you know not 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 do your towels and open your windows and that's okay so the private rented sector is included within that that suite from the government that's come through as a result of that tragic case so I might be looking at, I'm just thinking of ideas again, got, got a, a massive, but thinking about putting it in there, um, ten, like in the tenancy packs when they sign up and having something like that. I know you're probably working on it, but I'm just thinking, you know, things like that. It's, you, you know, fact sheet that you've, you know, and making sure when they sign it, it's a checklist that you've, another one that they've explained what it, you know, things like that. I know it's a bit more work, but it prevents, you know, anything, you know, hopefully prevents, you know, these kind of things happening again. But thank you. No, it's good, great work. Councillor Rogers. Right. Good evening. Um, it's about for Sarah, really. Um, she's probably aware that I've been dealing with two cases recently. Um, everything seems to be going all right. Um, do I get any feedback at all, or do I just wait? Because uh, what I'm trying to ask, really, is do you get any people where they seem to go off the radar? Because um, I've met both families, so I know where they are. I don't really want to go and ask them, is everything all right, if it's OK, or if it's not. Do I get any feedback from you at all? Thank you. Obviously, as long as there's an ATR, which is an authority to release, and I've received your emails, then I'm happy to speak to you by exception after the meeting. Yeah. To, um, or tomorrow to discuss them with you, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, you spoke about uh, private landlords, is that just um, housing associations or is that actual individuals as well? No, so that covers the whole range, so obviously we work with the private private landlord forum which covers not only those who um, you know might be registered providers of accommodation in affordable housing like your housing associations but also private landlords who may have one or two properties that they're leasing or, or, or renting with us and are able to offer that support so yeah, it covers everything and, and with, with, with them working with yourselves as the council do, do, which set of standards would they have to adhere to the councils or private sector are you talking about in relation to repairing standards um re repair standards um the, the stuff that we spoke about uh today really sorry yeah, yeah if you if you, you so you're talking about private landlords who may rent their own properties these yeah there are at the moment there are emerging decent home standards for private landlords they are on a par or will be i think this is moving forward it's not letting, not yet in legislation however when uh, the private sector team attend or go to um, you know reports of um, disrepair or concerns from a tenant um, there are standards called the housing health rating system so that they can go and identify hazards a category one hazard would be an immediate con con you know, an immediate issue or concern um, but usually with the private private sector it is largely something that the tenant needs to talk and look at with, the, with their own landlord however the private sector team will intervene mediate contact a, a landlord work with the tenant give advice um, you know, certainly that, that applies in the same way around illegal evictions or a, a private landlord trying to evict someone from their home. In the, f in the first part, we would rather try and intervene and, act and actually do the, you know, so we actually prevent something happening. But certainly the standards will be looking at those rating systems and, and, and quite often the private sector team can, they can condemn a house 
has been known. We, we've condemned houses in the past or we've given um, advisory notices and notices to landlords for improvements. So there's a range of, 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 of powers that a councillor can use for private landlords. Um, go, going back to the, um, the, well, the figures that are on the screen, actually, um, are all of them successes? Now, the figures that are on the, scheme, are, are on the screen are the um, reasons for approach. So they're the people who actually approach us for homelessness. And obviously every one of those requires an assessment, a personalised housing support plan, and, you know, depending on where they are in that sort of journey, it can be anything from us having to relieve that homelessness to us being then held for then also owing a full duty and having to prevent homelessness. Um, so those are everybody who comes through our door and as you can see there's between 60 and 80 a month yeah last year we had about I think it's 768 approaches in per annum so it's uh, but what I'm saying is that they've all been prevented from be becoming home homeless that's just the reasons for approaching the council that's not our prevention or relief figures um, so we, that's just the reasons why people have approached the council for assistance but but you have got a a evaluation system to, oh, to yes. see the successes yes yeah yeah well yeah, yeah i was going to yeah, say yeah, would it be possible for the the committee to see them yeah. please anybody else uh, just a couple about the work that's happening with, with uh sacred heart and m moving forward you said about the outreach officers being extended for a further two years uh, and I'm guessing that's that's funding allocated. That's not going anywhere. That's there. Is that the same as the work that's going to be happening with Sacred Heart? Because I think you, you said about extending it, or has that got to go to cabinet in February? Yeah. So I mean, we get um, homelessness prevention grant funding from the government. That's allocated uh, based on a settlement uh, annually. We've got a two-year deal in terms of that homelessness prevention grant, and one. The, the scheme that I outlined earlier, which we, we're still developing with partners and with the portfolio holder around the vulnerability and homelessness hub, um, is, will be funded through that. Um, and that is in addition to the scheme that was outlined in terms of the severe weather emergency protocol, the SWEP scheme that we run over the winter. So that's in addition. But that funding comes through external government funding and is part of that overall national strategy to address homelessness. Um, so you'd be taking it to the extensions, the additions to Cabinet in February that, that they don't need to allocate extra funding because this is going to be coming from a government part as such, not the Council's part? Yeah, in terms of, just to be absolutely clear, so in terms of our severe weather emergency protocol, our SWEP scheme with the heart of Tamworth, we've already got the approvals in place from Cabinet under the delegations to the portfolio holder, so that will continue. Um, what we'll be doing with Cabinet in February is setting out how the Homelessness Hub will work in the context of Housing First. So we'll be asking Cabinet, with any feedback from scrutiny tonight and through other member discussions, um, what those principles are, and then we'll be procuring that with a range of partners, um, no doubt expressing an interest in delivering that scheme, because that is different to the one that's already been provided by the Heart of Tamworth. I don't suppose you know what date it is in February. Cabinet is, I you? think it's the 23rd of February. Have we got the meeting? Do you think that you'd have that ready by the end of January, 24th, did you say, sorry? Yeah. Just to come back to us for any recommendations? Yeah, I mean, we're, I can discuss that with the portfolio holder. We can, you know, we'll see how far we've got in terms of the drafting of that report. Um, there will be some commercial sensitivity to that because obviously we will be subject to onward procurement. So we, you know, there might be elements that we have to redact or we have to keep confidential. 
Um, but yes, I don't see any reason why by the end of January we wouldn't have that developed. Yeah, happy to support that, Chair. Uh, anybody else? Um, ju just because of that last part there, I don't feel that there's any recommendations that, that I need to make or if, if the, any of the committee need to make, apart from the assurance that the, the figures, if the, uh, the success figures could be passed to, to the committee. So, so I can share them, mate. Uh, just like to. Councillor Farrell would like. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Thanks, Chair. No, I was just going to suggest that perhaps if we're coming back in January, we could bring those success figures there as well to present them. Um, and if there's nothing else, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us. Clearly, we've got some very well experienced and excellent officers on the job. And I'd also like to, with Terry's help, pass our thanks to the heart of town for everything they do as well. Um, but thank you, Chair. Yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, keep on, on the good work. Thank you. Uh, free to go. Okay, so item number six is the recovery and rest update. Uh, the committee requested an update on the recovery and rest work stream relevant to this committee be provided, uh, which is the smart working, third sector and vulnerability, and customer services offer. Uh, in attendance, we've got, we've got uh, Tina Mustafa, who we've uh, already heard of tonight. Uh, we have Zoe Willi 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 <laughs> Uh, and Joe Sands, um, and I'd just love to hand over to the officers, please. Um, obviously, Zoe and Joe will take the specific, they're the project leads, and they'll take the specific details around the customer services, smart working, and vulnerability. But just to draw the committee's attention to, you will have already seen the cabinet. Um, um, decisions that were made on the 8th of November updating on the approach around recovery and reset and the whole programme. So um, obviously, you know, as you refresh your memory around those recommendations, um, we can pick up on those key areas. Okay Zoe, thank you. Thank you Tina, thank you Chair. So um, I'm going to take you through firstly smart working. Um, smart working was um, implemented on the 1st of April this year and it, um, behind it was an absolutely enormous project which involved lots and lots of different aspects um, including a full review of our terms and conditions um, with options and costings um, to inform our executive management team to um, of the proposals for new conditions of service to support the smart working model. We also agreed the definition of home site and hybrid workers and I can give you some um, facts and figures of the numbers that we've got. So site based workers and these are the staff that can't complete their duties at home at all. For example, Castle, Tourist Information Centre, um, Assembly Room, Street Scene and that's 157 of our staff are site based and that's 37.5% of the workforce. Home-based, um, which is where the majority of the duties can be carried out at home. We have a mandatory contractual requirement to send site two days each month for team days, one-to-one um, -one meetings. Um, they also can attend site for collaborative meet, uh, work and other meetings as well, but site attendance will be no more than 40% of working time. And that's 41% of our staff, which is 172, are contractually home-based workers. And then the middle ground is the hybrid workers, and this is where some duties can be carried out at home, but site attendance is required. So that's... Um, um, jobs like our projects officers who go and um, check um, repairs etc so um, their site attendants constitute more than 40 percent of their total working time including those contractual two days a month and that's 90 of our team and it's 21 and a half percent so the HR team and the um, met with all heads of service and assistant directors um, to assign every member of staff as one of those um, 
types of worker. Um, we also worked very closely with the trade union liaison group and um, we signed off 25 terms and conditions of employment through extensive negotiation with the group. Um, every member of staff then had a one-to-one -one consultation to um, go through what the terms, of, the new terms and conditions, and also their designation in terms of their um, worker type. Um, we um, did a rota for the two days per month, so every team is coming in um, to make sure that we'd got enough space, and also we took into account all COVID um, safe. Um, precautions as well so and we've remained as that at the moment so all of the desks actually get, ensure that everybody can keep themselves safe. Um, every member of staff had a new statement of particulars which is the contract um, detailing their designi designation and also they had a letter which um, uh, detailed all of the changes to their particular terms and conditions everybody had diff um, different ones. Um, we also gave the opportunity for employees to appeal if they didn't um, agree with the designation. We had seven appeals, three were upheld and four were not. The main reason for the appeals was where staff um, didn't want to attend Marmy and Hass at all. They felt that the whole of their job could be done from home. The appeals that were held were on medical grounds. So the project was extremely successful and it is down to um, absolutely um, a fantastic job done by the whole of the HR team. Um, they worked tirelessly through those first few months of this year to actually get all of those terms and conditions, those letters, the contracts um, out to staff. We had no tribunal claims or grievances lodged over, over it. So um, the team are now reviewing all the HR policies and um, if you're on appointments and staffing committee in November we had 15 policies and procedures uh, which was something like 300 pages on the report um, that um, were considered and all approved. That um, was the culmination of the, a massive piece of work which was involved again with our trade union liaison group um, actually um, agreeing those terms and conditions um, policies and procedures. So um, the policies now make sure that the new terms and conditions of service are recognised in there. We've checked all um, legal compliance and um, renewed any best practice and um, made sure that everything's referenced about our worker designation. Um, we have developed a smart, smart working policy that um, covers everything that our team need to know but for their um, designation, including um, health and safety matters, um, equipment, um, how they claim mileage and, time, and their time recording as well included. So next steps, so we have closed the project out of um, recovery and reset, so it's no longer part of that project. But um, the policy and procedure work continues. And also um, a review after six months was um, commenced in October. So an, an all staff survey went out um, last week to obtain feedback from all, all of the team and their experience of smart working. And um, it will close um, on the 8th of December. This will help feed into the next stage in terms of our forever home and also the interim measures. As, as you know, it was agreed at Cabinet that we would remain in, in Marmion House and we're going to be looking at going just to the ground floor. Um, so all of this, the feedback we're getting at the moment is going to have feed into that. Thank you, that's smart working. Does anybody have any questions? Quite a few years ago, before I became a councillor, but I was a, a candidate, I sat in on a meeting um, where working from home was discussed uh, long before COVID, many, many years before COVID. Uh, I was allowed to speak as I was a candidate. And I brought up the, the um, it, I mean, it was fantastic, everybody working from home. Um, but I brought up the, the um, situation where somebody might not live in a family, they might live on their own, and so they're not going out from morning till night, they're working in it. And I've got two members of my family who are doing this, and it is affecting their mental health. Uh, not drastically, but there's a certain sadness over them that they don't go out anymore. There's a lack of sociability in their working life. And I know COVID has sort of thrust this upon us, 
But surely there must be some people who are not happy and have they got the opportunity to come into work full to like five days a week or is this actually being thrust upon them? And have you had any instances where people's mental health has been affected? Thank you. Um, we are doing a, a lot of work around wellbeing and one of those policies that I talked about earlier was wellbeing policy. Um, managers are checking in with their staff regularly and this is where regular one-to-one -one meetings and the team days are there to support that, that mental health um, angle as well. But we do put, have mechanisms in place that staff are talking on. We have um, Teams chat channels. We're not saying everybody's got to be nose to the grindstone from morning till night they have the opportunity to check in with colleagues as they would if they were in the office and they were stood by the water machine having a quick um, chat about you know the football the night before or something so we're actually very conscious about that and actively encourage people to have those conversations that might not be 100% work related but it's actually so that um, you know people can su support their mental health um, and you know we have as I said earlier we've had nobody grieve we've had nobody um, the, the we had the seven uh, we had the seven appeals but that was because people didn't want to come in so we feel that we've got the balance right with supporting people in the way that we can um, if somebody wants to come in um, as long as they're a home worker they can come in for two day up to two days a week um, um, we have a floor where there's a drop down um, there's desks for people to drop down so um, five days a week unfortunately not because that would be classed as a site, work, uh, site worker so the designations were looked at the job rather than the people but we're putting lots of mechanisms in place to support the people has the uh, financial situation that we're in now with the price of power um, are people sort of um, voicing any um, dissatisfaction with the fact that they've probably got to have the heating on all day, which if they were out at work, they wouldn't have to. And I mean, I think we're all dreading our next electric bills and gas bills. Um, so have, has, are there um, situations in place to recompense them for the, the power that they've got to use? Part of the terms and conditions was that we have a home work, we pay a home working allowance to those that are home workers and hybrid workers get a 50% of that home working allowance. So there is that recompense. Um, we are, we, we've got the survey out there. It is early days to know whether this is going to be a story that will come through from, from staff. I can't tell you because um, the survey is still live, but that's something that we will see um, hopefully through the responses there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, thank you on that. I mean, the other question I was just about. To ask you, um, just answered it. Um, so, so one of the things is obviously so, so with um, working at home, etc. Have you actually noticed if there's if there's actually kind of been. It? If the uh, productivity of everyone's actually um, kind of increased, or if it's about the same, or if it's actually uh, lowered a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Some of the anecdotal feedback that we've had um, about people coming into the office for the days is they feel that they, they, they're not productive. And COVID did thrust us into this, we know that. But, um, you know, we're getting anecdotal feedback from staff that they feel they're a lot more productive at home. Um, I know that um, when you were, we, people were working on the open plan floor, there was obviously that distraction when you've actually got more of a um, control over decide you make a call at that time or you you know you're still taking phone calls but it's not that same as the the face to face so we are having people say they feel they're more productive at home thanks for coming thank you chair it, it's just a simple question really would it be possible for us to have sight of the um the home working allowance policy thank you well, yes, I can. I can send it to the committee. It's as part of the smart working policy. But was that policy put in place 
presumably before all the financial crisis has hit. So could it be that the amount won't be enough to cover things? The amount of the allowance that's paid is in line with HMRC um, regulations, so right. it couldn't be in increased. There would be tax liability yeah. for staff if we did increase it, and they'd have to. Everybody would have to do a self uh, self assessment. So it is the maximum it can be under the HMRC guidance. Okay, but we can see the policy. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, just one for me. Is this smart working? Does that? Cover the front of face, or is that somebody else's? Next one. That's the next one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come back on that one. Yeah. Anybody else? Next one, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, um, the customer offer. Um, since we last updated you, um, the customer face to face offer has continued um, through the Tamworth Information Centre at the um, Assembly Rooms. It enables us to provide direct advice, signposting um, to um, council services and also voluntary sector services, and where necessary, face-to-face -face booked appointments are made. Um, we have also increased the size of the signage which is displayed at Marmion House. Um, at CIC Tamworth Together also have signs, as does the library, um, to give the main contact points, including signposting to the, the assembly rooms for those queries that need um, a face-to-face -face, um, response. So demand from residents is very low, um, an average of 24 visits per month. Uh, for inquiries, um, which would have previously been dealt with through Marmion House reception. That's approximately one a day because the TIC is open six days a week. Um, the data is letting us um, identify demand hotspots. And so, for example, we see an increase in visits when um, council tax letters have been issued, which um, that in turn enables us to make sure that the staffing levels are right if we know that letters are going to be issued. We continue in as a customer service team to assist customers through a range of channels. Um, last year, um, they took 68,000 telephone calls, dealt with 19,000 emails into the, um, um, the inquiries um, inbox, and over 13,000 web chats. We are continuing to develop our um, digital offer, particularly around um, our customer portals. So the My Tamworth portal has now over 1,300 registrations, and the My Housing, which is for council tenants, has um, 622 verified sign-ups. And also we've um, had um, nearly 2,000 housing applications through that portal. We are seeing a direct correlation in the um, reduction in number of web chats when um, with, with, with the increase in sign-ups to the portal. Now, that's quite interesting because it's showing that there is a, um, an element of um, the resi residents that do actually want to engage with us in that way. Um, so in terms of my Tamworth portal, customers can view the council tax balances, they can inform us about moves um, in terms of um, council tax in and out of a property, they can report street scene issues, the clean and green, so on the clean side, um, glass for example or needles, and also on the green side it might be trees or grass, um, and they can also make a complaint on that my Tam Tamworth portal. So we are continuing to um, uh, keep an eye on the impact for customers and also the service demands through that um, um, the, through the assembly rooms um, we are signposting customers to the community and Joe is going to be talking to you about that in a little while officers do just for information visit tenants at their homes we um, face to face appointments are regularly arranged for things like taxi licensing um, our environmental health teams are seeing people in a face to face and also Sarah and team who are here tonight for homelessness they are having face to face um, appointments we have had no formal complaints um, since this um, delivery models been in place and on the 10th of November um, Tina referenced it earlier the um, cabinet approved approved for us to continue our face-to-face -face service via the TIC at the assembly rooms so thank you yeah. um, I suppose it's an overlap question here in the previous section you mentioned uh, about the people who have to come into the office two days a month 
Um, but you said that could in, that could include face to face face to face appointments. I'm hoping that doesn't include if they need a face to face appointment with any member of the public. Sorry, could you repeat your question? So, so, so you said that um, people who have to come into the office for anything, it's up to two, two days a month. Mm -hmm. But if, if somebody goes to the advice centre and needs a face-to-face -face appointment, uh, if somebody's been in work for two days in that month, uh, are they saying, that, oh, you've got to wait till next month for a face-to-face? So the designation, so it's 40% of, up to 40% of working time for those who are home workers. So that's two days per week. Um, and include yes, yeah, so they can. But if they're going to, if they're likely to need to um, see customers or um, be on site for more than that, then there would be a hybrid worker, and that's forty percent um, over forty percent of their working time every week. Um, I suppose I just want to ask as well: Is there any work going on in the background if the levelling up fund doesn't come through? Are we working on a? a, a a, a different plan for where to go. Okay, thank you. So, um, obviously, part of the cabinet decision on the eighth of November, as you're probably aware, was to continue those interim and temporary arrangements um, because obviously the levelling up agenda presented an opportunity with Gungate, um, and you will have seen the separate cabinet decisions around around that. Um, we're currently awaiting an announcement. So, just before we were doing that, the idea was we would move temporarily up to five years. But when we investigated different locations where we could go, whether that was the former bingo site on Gungate or whether it was in Anchorside, the costs of doing that were going to be between anything between one and three million pounds. So as that decision was looked at in April, the government then announced the levelling up uh, prospectus and agenda in May. So the view was, well, because that now includes a public sector hub with office accommodation on there, we might as well use any funding we've got for that for he for that forever arm rather than spend money on a temporary or interim step so to answer your question in a slightly long-winded way it was you know if we don't get that leveling up funding then i think the view will be that we would look to use that money that we would have used from a temporary relocation to just do some scalp gap back pans but what that looks like will be dependent upon what the outcome is to that um but certainly you know we we will need to be moving out of marmion you know, within the next couple of years, because I think the, the prospectus, and again, Anna Miller, who's the AD of Regeneration and Growth, has been leading this particular project, but that levelling up time scale was that something would have to be delivered by 2025. So I think the view was that because the time scales were so tight on that, that would mean that we would simply delay moving from Marmion by up to two years in favour of that. But if we don't get that funding, then it's a scaled back plan on that site if that's the decision at the time but then we will have to reassess what those priorities are and that'll be a fresh update to cabinet thank you so i suppose a, a lot of the groundwork of costings and that's already already been done so, so, so i suppose the planning has already took place it's just when we get to when the government want to give us the decision um that either which way we, we have got a direction a steer to go Absolutely. I mean, all I would just caution with that, though, is that the original plans that were done through the recovery and reset were on a temporary basis, so we're up to five years, and they were based on either renting in the town centre or on retrofitting what would have been bus or the former bingo site. Obviously, the plans around the levelling up are around providing and re-providing something that's new. So again that should provide a different but we're going to have to assess that and who knows we're currently waiting for the announcement you know it was supposed to be autumn winter could be crisp you know mm. if it's like the future high street fund it'll be christmas Boxing eve Boxing 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 Day. Day. Boxing Day. uh anybody else uh, next one is that it yes. okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, yeah, the, the vulnerability strand of the reset and recovery, I, I think hopefully that, you know, Councillors, you, you'll understand that the vulnerability, the work with the voluntary sector, looking at those who are, you know, in vulnerability and, and, and need or require services either from ourselves or our partners is, is part of our day job. Um, it certainly showed us through COVID um, how much 
value um, or added value and extremely good work comes from our voluntary sector organisations in Tamworth. Um, so as we've gone through the reset and recovery, um, we've you know we, we started from the the, the, the principle that what, what are we looking at to make sure that those most vulnerable in our communities can access Tamworth Council services in the first instance. Um, and it's also become very clear from that that we need to look at then also how the residents access other services via our partners and how we work. So in the first instance within, within the vulnerability strand, we did a, a baseline uh, report that, that, that formed part of the initial um, reports to cabinet we adopted a we, we we had some discussions around vulnerability and how you define vulnerability um and you know some people are vulnerable don't realize they're vulnerable people we may call vulnerable actually don't feel that they're vulnerable um so we, we adopted the, the the definition that that the police actually do use that a person is vulnerable um if as a result of their situation or circumstances they were unable to take care or protect themselves or others from harm or exploitation. So, you know, as we've heard that we, we you know, you, someone loses their job or becomes homeless, they suddenly become vulnerable. So from the, the baseline work, we took the, the, the vulnerability that came through COVID. So you know, people at risk of health, people at risk of financial exclusion, people who no longer work, people who lose their jobs or may become homeless. So we have five strands to the vulnerability. We have financial exclusion, so you know issues with, with, with not having enough money to 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 um, have a lifestyle and afford things and be at risk we have the social exclusion and everybody can testify within within covid the social exclusion issues were very very high people felt you know they, they were staying in they couldn't go out they'd got they couldn't see their friends so the social exclusion element of that there's also a digital exclusion element um, and we need to explore that further. Obviously, as a council, you know, our, our premise is digital first, but it's also recognising that there are people who, who still do not use um, digital, you know, digital equipment, the, the IT, um, the internet. Mental health came up very, very, very high on um, issues for people. And also, as to, you know, we've alluded to tonight, housing, losing your home, being a fear of losing your home for, for various different reasons. So we have five sort of streams to that vulnerability strand. We've worked very closely. We've, we've done some work with our staff um, to understand within our teams across the council how and who they work with. For, for people at risk and people who may become vulnerable. Um, as Tina said, Heart of Tamworth is, is our key organisation for the homelessness streams. We have anchor organisation Community Together CIC that started by providing a telephone line in COVID, during COVID, um, which we initially funded um, or gave a contribution to fund. That telephone line is continuing and will continue. They provide that um, six days a week. Um, and that, that has helped the social exclusion point of view. Um, we are working, we, Zoe's team uh, and my team have looked at what kind of calls come into the council specifically that may not be for us to deal with. It could be a mental health issue, it could be something else. So therefore that's that signposting that we want to continue to signpost to the voluntary sector where they can help. So for instance, with a digital exclusion, CTCIC very specifically provides some form filling um, services to, to help people with, with their benefits or other forms that they may need to fill in. Um, the financial aspect, we've already heard this evening that we actually, the, the Tina's team commissioned a further service through our Tamworth Advice Centre to actually do some outreach service up at Sacred Heart. Um, and there are drop-in sessions now available as well, and members of the public can actually use the services directly at Sacred Heart. Um, there is also some outreach through the, the food bank at the Manor House. They, they, they go there. Um, we, we, as I said, we commissioned Tamworth Advice Centre. Our heat service, Beat the Cold, um, is, is still commissioned to actually give advice around hating homes at the moment. Um, and the, we've worked with mental health teams, as the committee know, through the mental uh, MPFT, mental 
the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. Um, they have actually um, allocated some funding for Tamworth to work in partnership with us for warm spaces. So we've actually given additional money um, for warm spaces during the week um, across Tamworth. Uh, that has just been finalised at the moment and I'm hoping to give, give councillors a, a full detail on the, where the warm spaces um, will be, will be um, operating from during the winter. Um, and, and also, as we've said, there is also a mental health support worker for tenancy sustainment within that will actually be working with our housing teams, our homelessness teams, to take people who may be at risk through the services of the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust to actually help sustain their tenancies. So there are, there are many strands to the vulnerability offer. What we haven't done yet is until such times as we understand what our front-facing offer will be um, and also looking at some of the more raw data of the vulnerability sets across the town is to undertake a, a work to do a, a vulnerability strategy. So what is it that we as Tamworth Borough Council are responsible for and offer and can help and commission and work with the voluntary sector and our other partners to understand vulnerability and what can we work with other strategy of you know, the health um, partners to understand what they do that vulnerability strategy work has not fully started um, we are looking to use some of the uk shared prosperity fund um, to actually commission um, the, the work to do that strategy uh, and we will hear shortly from the government that we are you know we, we will receive that funding so that will actually allow us to look actually dig down and look at a lot of the data and make sure that we are reaching out to people who may need further help um, and I think until such times you know as we've looked at and we understand what our offer is front facing the voluntary sector are very much spearheading that vulnerability they will actually you know signpost for us and therefore what do we need to commission further we already commissioned the Tamworth Advice Centre we commissioned the heat services we've actually just commissioned a further um, room at the uh, at CTCIC so that we can actually get other voluntary sector services in there and through our locality deal fund with the Staffordshire Commissioner's Office we have also as I said commissioned better way recovery and there may be other services that will actually help the vulnerable um, and people across Tamworth and I think we will we, we've got sufficient information now we're working really well in partnership and hopefully that will continue as we go along and move along and that's it uh, anyone um i suppose uh, figures wise so, so so you've got all these commissioned outlets mm -hmm. uh, are they all forwarding back into you how many people have been to them that are coming under your classification of Vulnerable. I think we um, in January I will be bringing quite a lot of those figures as part of that housing strategy and health, health and well-being. Uh, yes, uh, as part of the Commission services, obviously you know, they have uh, KPIs and statistics they send in to us. So um, I'm, I'm already getting um, quite a lot of information through from CTCRC. But as we we realise, unfortunately, there are increases to calls, increases for financial support. Um, and I think, you know, um, with the Beat the Coals, they have got that full figure um, and our Tamworth Advice Centre can certainly provide those figures. So that will be part of the, the sort of information that I'll be bringing in January as part of the update that's requested from the health and wellbeing for both the housing strategy and covering the health and wellbeing part of that. None of that needs to be restricted, though, does it? Generally, it, it's not named. It's not. It is absolutely. Yeah, it, it's absolutely just figures and facts. A little bit like our, our team has presented. You know that we know that people are. Uh, there are more increases to family breakdown for homelessness. It, it, it'll be things like that. Why and how and what people are ringing up for. So, maybe as opposed to the, the, them coming back a, a, as one block, to, to maybe split them up onto two agenda items. So, Pete, if we do have to close part of the meeting for other talks at least people can still hear them them facts and figures mm -hmm. um, on the the warmer places uh, I think it was either today or yesterday 
CIC released a poster. Is that the same, going to be the same warmer places? Yeah, the, the, the poster that was released by um, CTCIC that we actually um, uh, uh, facilitated the funding for the printing of that, yeah, that gives the general across the town at the moment what is available uh, and where people can actually go for assistance and help. So Tamworth Advice Centre is on there, Beat the Cold is on there, what places of welcome. They are the um, operating um, things that are going on anyway so that's their business as usual the warm spaces um will be facilitated probably next week when we've confirmed with the staffage foundation trust um who have actually got the money it's money that's been allocated in partnership with mpft so that will be a further information and leaflet so that will be additional to the one that ctcic has actually printed um with the, the, the figures that I just spoke about before that question, you can do a lot of the work, but I'd suggest that before the that funding pot you was on about from the government, so, so you already know, know them figures. Um, Funding-wise, are you, for, say for the next two years, are we looking in a safe-ish place? We have, uh, forgive me, I can't remember off the top of my head, it, it, there's about over £100,000 within the partnerships pot. Um, that will facilitate the continuation of the Tamworth Advice Centre. The Tamworth Advice Centre is definitely uh, there with an extra, we, we did it, we're in its third year now and we've got an option to do a further two years. Um, so yeah, that is within our main uh, mainstream budgets, and I think Tina's team contribute to that as well. And as far as I know, that will will remain within your budgets um, to do that because of the benefits of doing that. We can yeah. clearly show a benefit. The beat the cold services across Staffordshire, uh, Tamworthborough Council. Yes, we have the funding there for that. At the moment, we only uh, commission that, and it costs us ten thousand pounds a year. Um, because it's a, a, a county service, we tap in and we do more specific advice. But certainly there is funding within the partnerships pot for that. We've secured the extra room for the um, CTCIC uh, for a three-year grant plus another year, so that's up to four years. Our locality deal funding through the Staffordshire Commissioner's Office is for a further two years. So that, that was guaranteed for three years. So what the, the, the interventions that we have at the moment are secure. Obviously, as we look to do a vulnerability strategy and a commissioning strategy for our, for our voluntary sector, we may need to, to look and see if there's any further money that either comes through ourselves just as Tamworth for a council, maybe with some in input from Tina's team from the homelessness side or the HRA, if it's our tenants. Certainly, there are other, are other parts of funding you know, through our, for the locality deal. So, yes, I would, at the moment... And if we do need additional, then obviously that will become part of policy change and requests and, and evidence base to councillors. Uh, Councillor Grote, Thank you. Uh, regarding the, the warm spaces, will people be limited to how long they can stay there, first of all? And secondly, if they're there for a long time, is there any availability for um, food and drink? The, the specific warm spaces that have been commissioned um, through MPFTs for this winter until March the 31st, obviously it's additional to, to what the groups are doing. So there, there will be a time limit to the time that maybe I think, I can't, I can't think for, for argument's sake, yeah, uh, the assembly rooms will be opening on a Monday between 11 and 1 um, to provide soup, a roll. Uh, people can come and watch the television, they may be putting films on. So, so the assembly rooms is, is there for 11 to 1 on a Monday, uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The idea was that the MPFT said, could we provide something or could organisations provide something? It doesn't need to be the same organisation, but it should be one day per week. And, and we've pretty much got that. that there, there will be something every day of the week, uh, including the normal run of the mill, not, I don't mean that just disrespectfully, the normal day-to-day -day operations of the, the, the voluntary sector in, in our town. Um, so, yes, when they open, they will be limited opening. They won't be open all day, 24 hours a day, but there will be something every day 
somewhere in the town. Thanks for cook. Um, so with these swarmers, bases, etc., if we had a person in there that say that was homeless, would the area which is actually the therein would the other staff there actually recognise that and then actually um um be able to to notify anyone else to like cut to get the the extra uh, help etc. Yes, our key organisations, absolutely. Uh, we've worked a lot on that with COVID. That is the signposting that we've said our teams can signpost to the voluntary sector and equally the voluntary sector organisations are extremely good at, at, at working with our teams and, and actually uh, giving, you know, um, actually giving them back to us or bringing them up on our behalf. Um, I do, you know, that that's something that we, we want to work with. You know, we, we've we've also made sure that the police know where the warm spaces are, so they can drop down. PCSOs will drop in. Um, so yes, it, it, it works both ways, and, and we would really encourage that. Anybody else? No. Um, so uh, there's no report to be considered uh, here because it was just a. V v verbal um, report. Um, I haven't got any recommendations as the committee. Um, so I'd just, just like to say thank you. It sounds like a lot of work has, has gone in across the work streams. Um, and it's good to hear that, that the figures about the, the, the front of house as well, and especially with the chat service that's now coming into force on the, the um, customer uh, portals. Um, yeah, so I'd like to say thank you, thank you and uh, good evening to you all. Thank you. Uh, item number seven, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Uh, so the committee's recommendation in respect of the safeguarding children and adults at risk report was taken to cabinet. Um, I think it was me that moved the motion, uh, but I think Councillor Claymore took it to uh, cabinet. Uh, it was resolved that the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee recommend to cabinet that it consider whether all public facing staff should complete suicide prevention slash awareness training uh, and some really good outcomes from the, the I think from the, from that cabinet uh, meeting and um, the presentation that. Council Claymore gave to, to Cabinet. Uh, so at the 10th of November Cabinet meeting, Cabinet agreed, one, that the recommendation as worded above is referred to the Chief Executive and Head of Paid Services to expedite suicide and awareness training to all public facing staff as appropriate. Point two, that all councillors should receive mental health first aid training. Point three, that a session is organised for all councillors to receive a presentation from the Samaritans to update councillors on the ongoing work and point four to release specific contingencies where necessary to allow this training to go ahead uh, and ju just um, informed just before this meeting that, that uh, Samaritans might be looking at putting on a uh, an evening in January uh, that, that we could all attend um, but just waiting on a, a, a definite date for that. Uh, anybody got anything to say on, on that point? Nope. Uh, item number eight, uh, consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. Uh, there's been no new items. Item number nine, update on health related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. A written update on the two October County meetings attached. Uh, so that's the 3rd and 17th of October. Uh, there was also a county meeting yesterday, uh, which Councillor Jay did attend, uh, but he's not here tonight. So I will ask him to give me a written update that I can pass around to 
to the rest of the committer. Uh, item number 10, forward plan. Uh, has anybody seen anything on the forward plan that they'd like to be considered? Nope. Uh, item number 11, the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. Uh, that's what we've got here. So, 24th of January 2023 meeting, uh, possible items including the housing strategy, performance, reporting. That's different to the one that I just said, it's isn't it? It's the one Joe was talking about. Uh, it is that one. So, so at an earlier committee, Joe Sands attended and did a presentation on yes. the housing strategy yes. and so, regular reporting the homeless strategy. starting in January. Yeah. But she didn't mention it in relation to yeah. that. Uh, then the green and open spaces and the disabled facilities grants process. Um, that's looking like a really busy meeting, but I think it's important that the elements from the homeless strategy come to ourselves before it goes to cabinet in the February meeting. Um, personally, I think green and open space would come off that and put the homelessness strategy in place. Council Climber. Yeah, Chair, I think that, that seems a, a sensible thing. I think we do need to look at that before it goes to Cabinet. Um, and green and open spaces seems one that could possibly be moved further down there in the year. Uh, has anybody got anything else to bring uh, Council Claymore? Sorry, not wanting to hog the, um, the working plan. Um, we did have, um, going back some time from full council, um, there was a commitment made from Health and Wellbeing that we would look at the public toilets facilities in Tamworth. Um, I think we need to set up a working group on that because that's something that may have an effect on the budget. We said that here, didn't we, before? Yeah, so um, maybe we need to set up a working group on that. And additionally, sorry, additionally there's the, um, the item on travellers that I know was mentioned at, was it corporate? No, ISAG. Yeah, ISAG, um, not last week or the week before, so I think there is some um, background work needs to be done on that as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so, so on the, the, the toilets, um, I think I set up a working group at the last meeting, I, th I think I put you and me on it. <laughs> We've cancelled my drop. Um, so, we will look at getting that in the meeting after the January one. Uh, well, we can speak about what the working group's done in the January meeting, but ho hopefully form some proper recommendations after that. Um, and the travellers uh, from the the ISAG meeting, which which was at uh, the strategy has been released by Staffordshire. Uh, and the officers are going to be looking at formulating a policy from that so we can all work alongside each other. Um, I'd probably want to give them a week or two to, to, to get get OFA with the, the, the strategy so they can brainstorm their ideas to bring us something as a working group, not committee. Yeah, Chair, I was just bringing it up because it, it doesn't feature anywhere in the working plan, so I just wanted to, you know, make sure that it's still on the radar. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'll get that added on into one of the work streams. Anybody else? Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for tonight and uh, close the meeting at... 1951 uh, and thank you for attending. Everybody have a good evening.